All right, so back in the summer of 2012, I was speaking at a convention, a Christian teen convention called Summer in the Sun, S-O-N, at Shannon, my wife and I's alma mater, Kentucky Christian University. And I had been there several times to speak at that event, but in 2012, by that time there had been a rhythm of them putting us up in married student housing in an apartment for every time me and my wife and kids would come along to this event so we could all, you know, stay together, have a place to get away when I wasn't speaking and when we weren't around people. And so that's where we stayed, was in married student housing. At the time, Zion, our oldest, was uh, eight. Aslan, our daughter, was seven. Journey, our youngest, was five. And so it was obvious one evening that there was a storm coming. We were talking about it, you know, it was in the forecast. There are all these signs. A storm is coming. So we're preparing for that. Also, Shannon's sister Joy and her two sons had made a drive of a couple hours to come visit us at this convention because she lived in Kentucky and we were a couple hours away. So they visited us, but we knew they were getting ready to get on the interstate to go home and the storm was coming and we were worried for them, had a little prayer circle for them before they left, like, all right, be careful. We don't know how big the storm's going to be. And then eventually, at some point in that process of them getting ready to leave, the outdoor warning siren started. And so it wasn't Saturday noon. We knew, like, this is, this is about the storm. Like, this isn't just a test. This is a storm. It's like, you know, like, oh, dang. Now, when you hear that, or even as a kid when you heard it, what particular type of storm did you associate that with? Tornado, yeah. It could be high winds. It could be whatever. It's like, if you're outdoors, get in, seek shelter, turn on the media, find out what's going on. So, but that's the instinct is like, oh, snap, it might be a tornado, you know? And so we hear that. So we're, now we're on total alert and we're watching for the storm. And there's even a point where we went up some stairs where we could look out off kind of a balcony and we we're watching over the campus. And you could see actually across the whole campus, not a big campus, Kentucky Christian University, ain't nobody been drafted in the NFL from there, okay? Small school, but you could see across, and it was a very dry summer, it had been, so the, the, the ground was very, very dry, dusty, and all of a sudden, we saw the storm. It was crazy. I've never seen anything like it. We saw the weather front come in, and the front boundary of it moving across the campus toward us, and we were like, uh uh and it was moving fast like a locomotive and the front of that boundary as it came was just whipping up dust in front of it you could just literally see it coming at us like a train and we were all just standing there with our eyes wide open like oh well, this looks crazy it was one of the most awesome things i'd seen and it was flying at us coming across the and i mean just coming at us across this little campus as fast as it might have been three or four seconds that it took to get across that entire campus well shannon said what we're all thinking she said tornado and we're all like, ah! now zion our oldest at that point uh, i've told you before about this recurring nightmare he has with this monster in his dreams called the goo goo grumbler he, he wants to talk to you about it anytime he'll talk to you about it after service today but the only other nightmare he had had up to that point was about a tornado and he was scared to death of tornadoes leading up to this event and so shannon yelled tornado Everyone bolted toward the apartment, just started running to the apartment, immediate wailing from all three kids, headed, well, I'm a dad, so I stay out for just a few more seconds, like, I want to feel it hit me, I want to feel it hit me, and so I'm also looking, because I'm like, we can see so well, I don't see a funnel cl cl cloud anywhere, I don't know what kind of storm this is, it's awesome, whatever it is, but I don't see a funnel cloud, so I waited just like a couple seconds, and they all bolted to the apartment, and I came in just a beat behind, so they all went in, went to their respective rooms, bedroom, bedroom, we had like, it was like a three-bedroom apartment, so kids went into the bedrooms, and, and Shannon disappeared in there, and I came running through yelling, it's not a tornado, it's not a tornado, it's not a tornado, and the thing embedded in my memory is running down the hallway, passing Zion's room to my right, he was sleeping as we all were, maybe not me and Shannon, but they all had mattresses on a floor. And so we're run, running through, and he had a mattress on a floor, and I see this eight-year-old child writhing in fear in his mattress yelling, I don't want to die! <laughs> and I remember just being like, buddy, it's not a tornado, you're not going to die. But it was the most awesome storm I think I've ever seen, just to have that perspective of it coming and the power of it. In fact, Zion took a picture 
on his DS at that time. Uh, this is me kind of just like checking things out. This is his cousin Nicholas and his DS because they were all like playing together. And I think just to solidify in his memory forever, it was not a, it was not a tornado. It was what? A thunderstorm. Like remember that with my rainbow font as I write. Okay. It was a thunderstorm. It's not a tornado. So we are starting a new series this week. For the past two years, we've been sporadically working through the Gospel of Mark in the Bible. And Mark is the oldest of all historical accounts of the life and teachings of Jesus. It's the first gospel written. So here we have who the historical Jesus really is, uh, the real Jesus, if you will. And so now we're arriving in the Gospel of Mark at basically a series of power miracles that Mark has grouped together very purposefully in his gospel. Ultimately, these four miracles are basically framed as four incredible showdowns between Jesus and some other type of powerful force. And I don't know if you're like me, but to me, I get pretty excited when there's some kind of exciting 1v1 coming. You know, something that's like, oh, this thing's coming, this versus this. I get pretty excited about that kind of thing, whether it's Drake versus Kendrick Lamar. You know, whether it's, thank you for the two that got that. I got some white church going on here. Um, Jake Paul and Mike Tyson, um, you know, like, okay, okay, that's interesting. I ain't paying for it, but it's interesting. You know, Mayweather versus Pacquiao, which ended up being the most boring fight that ever took place in history. I just paid to watch people hug each other. Um, and so, but even if it's fictional, Batman versus Superman, ooh, intriguing, what's going to happen here? Or we're a sucker a lot of times for two epic villain forces to go 1v1. You know, you got Alien versus Predator, you got King Kong versus Godzilla, you got Freddy versus Jason, you got Trump versus Biden. I mean, you know, like I could stand all day on that. See, I'll take you all off at once, all right? Two evil presences, but one of them is the second Messiah. Maybe he's not. Either of them, okay? So, uh, you know, just, just seeing those 1v1s, the one I got most excited for in my life was Tyson versus Holyfield, 1, 1996. Oh, man, I was so pumped for that. I loved Evander Holyfield. Uh, Evander, the real deal Holyfield. But I knew Tyson was a force, man. There was nobody like Tyson fighting. And so I remember watching that. I mean, paid for it. Me and my college buddies on a 10-inch TV VCR combo. I kid you not. 10 inches. We gathered around that thing. I mean, we were watching. Like, did he hit him? I can't tell. Did he hit him? And then they, they you know, uh, Holyfield won TKO in 11 rounds, then they had a rematch seven months later, and I think Tyson bit off more than he could chew. It was <laughs> crazy what happened. Uh, but man, he just, he couldn't handle Evander, Evander the Real Meal Holyfield, and so that fight went down in history as the bite fight, is what they called it, and it was a new era for boxing, for sure. So I could do this all day. I could do it all day, people. All day. All right. So... It's always so interesting to see two powerhouse forces go up against each other. So here Mark gives us, and this isn't like Dan created this, this is creative. This is Mark doing this intentionally. This is Jesus versus nature, then Jesus versus evil, then Jesus versus sickness, then Jesus versus death. Dan didn't come up with that, Mark did. Like he's like, I want you to see these power miracles of Jesus. So you ready for this? Let's get it on. Here we go. All right, so verse 35. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, really more of a lake. Let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So we'll pause right there. Okay, this is an amazingly vivid story, and I just have to start off a little bit by being the nerd that I am. There's only about 150 words, depending on the English translation you're reading. Tremendously compact, incredible economy of style. But one thing that scholars often comment about about this story is how many unnecessary details there are in it. So what do I mean by unnecessary details? Well, that day when evening came, we're told when it happened in the day, Jesus went on the boat just as he was. That means he didn't change clothes before they got in the boat. Um, there were also other boats with him. 
if you've known this story all your life or familiar with the scripture for years, how many of you never realized there were many boats when the storm was calm? There were all these boats with them. Uh, also, Jesus was in the stern. It tells what part of the boat. He's in the rear of the boat. He's not in the bow. And then, lastly, we're told he was sleeping on a cushion. So historians who know anything about fishing and boating in those days would tell you that um, if you were a passenger on a boat, you weren't a sailor, you weren't a fisherman, you were there kind of sitting as a passenger, then there was a cushion under the coxswain, coxswain seat for your comfort. It was for your, like, you're just going to be sitting there, everybody else is going to be getting up, moving around, doing things. So there was a cushion under the coxswain seat for you, and Jesus fell asleep on that cushion. So why would scholars call these details unnecessary? Well, here's the deal. Any scholar of ancient literature will tell you that that's not how ancient fiction was written. If this was a legend that was made up, this miracle story, because that's a lot of knee-jerk reactions, like, wait a minute, this is a legend to make Jesus somebody bigger than he was. Ancient legends, ancient fiction was not written like this. If you were going to write or fabricate a legend, um, you, you wouldn't include details that don't help you develop the character or move the plot along. Okay, They're, they just wouldn't be helpful. So these details would be pointless to the story of an ancient writer. Scholars will say, that it hasn't been until the last 200 years that fiction writers have added in little details to give stories the aura of reality. He reached down and he grabbed the doorknob and he turned the cold doorknob slowly and he opened it with a slow creak. These details, that's just stuff that authors have done in the last 200 years. Ancient authors never did that. If you remember when you were bored to death in high school, happened to read um, Beowulf, or the Iliad, or the Odyssey, if you, maybe some of you are like, I still read some of that stuff, but you never see those kind of details in ancient fiction and in legendary stories. You never see little notations like he was on a cushion, there were several other boats around him, uh, he was rocking the same outfit as he was earlier, okay? Like, who cares what he was wearing when he got on the boat that he didn't change clothes? You never read Odysseus was on the starboard bow as he paced and thought about what he'd have for lunch. You know, the starboard bow, that would never be mentioned of Odysseus. Or Hercules changed into a green toga before he went out to fight the dragon. No one cares what Hercules is wearing. Ancient writers didn't write details like that. So why are these details included? Because the eyewitness, the storyteller, remembered them. That's the only explanation for it. The, the, in, Unless Mark is centuries ahead of his time in writing, unlike anyone else ever wrote. It's because the eyewitness, scholars will tell you these unnecessary, unnecessary details are the mark, no pun intended, of an eyewitness account. Otherwise, there was a fisherman named Simon Peter who was on that boat, who is the one who told Mark, these are the details of the story, and Mark was basically his biographer, you know, or the person who wrote his memoirs for him, who wrote it down. Peter's like, he was in the back, he was in the stern of the boat, and he was sleeping on this cushion. And there are all these boats around us. And it, that's the mark of an eyewitness account, a historical account. So it's bubbling with historical accuracy and account. And so the storms in the Sea of Galilee, they were common because it's, I, I've been on the Sea of Galilee probably 10 or 12 years ago, and uh, it, it's this lake that's surrounded by high ground. And there's a cleft in the southern part of the lake where sometimes storms will come through, wind will come through that cleft, and a storm can be on you like that in the Sea of Galilee. We went out in the boat when I was there, and I remember it was supposed to sprinkle. It was getting, like, gray and all that. We were trying to decide, do we have the parade? Do we not have the parade? And th there was a storm coming. I was like, please let it be a bad one. Like, I wanted to experience what went on here, and then it just ended up sprinkling. But these storms can come on people like that, and so... Anyone who was a sailor or, in this case, like a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, they would have been almost jaded about how often it stormed when they're out in the lake. So the point is, this must have been one heck of a storm for the disciples to come to Jesus and be like, dude, wake up. Don't you even care? We're about to drown here. For sailors or fishermen to be that scared of a storm to come to Jesus and be like, Jesus, wake up. 
I don't want to die. Like, they're acting like kids here. This must be a heck of a storm. And so the disciples' reaction, I think, is very natural. Like, we're scared, Jesus. Don't you care? Like, we're really scared. They don't just say, Master, do something. They come and say, Teacher, you don't care that we're drowning. Like, wake up. You don't care that we're drowning. And at this point, we should be on, like, very familiar emotional terrain with the disciples, right? Like, something's going on in their life. It's scary. It's tumultuous. And immediately, we want to question whether God cares about us, cares about our story. If you've never felt that way, you either, you're either very young, very naive, or extraterrestrial, okay? Um, so... Uh, you know, they're saying, Lord, we thought that if you were with us in the boat, these things couldn't happen. If you were with us, uh, how is there a storm? You know, like we thought that if you were in the boat, our, our lives couldn't sink. You know, we thought that if you were with us, if we're following you, then we would have little problems, but not big problems. And dude, this is life or death. Like we're scared to death. We're sinking. I don't want to die. It's basically like saying, if you cared, you wouldn't let this happen. And if you let this happen, you don't care. That's essentially the, the thing that's going on here with the disciples and Jesus. So I just can't underscore enough. The presence of a storm is not proof that Jesus doesn't care about you. The, a, a storm is totally compatible with Jesus' caring power. It's totally compatible. And so we'll see in verse 40, in fact, that Jesus eventually... Not only does he rebuke the wind and the waves, but he rebukes the disciples. And he was pretty much a patient guy. Like, we've seen him interact with tax collectors and, you know, the way he interacts in other gospels, the woman at the well, and all these people, people who were sinners. But he, he shows very little, like, patience and more like, I need to correct this in this situation with his disciples here. And he actually rebukes their lack of faith later on. Um, I think this is why. There's a story by Elizabeth Elliot, who was a Christian missionary to Ecuador. And she has, uh, if you've been around the church at all or, or, you know, familiar with some stories of Christianity, she has kind of a famous one, but she was one of the most influential Christian women of the 20th century. And she had the story that she would tell that she would go visit friends in northern Wales, and they had a, they had a sheep farm. And she said one time she was there when the shepherd had to do something that was pretty awful to the sheep. She was there, and saw that the shepherd would go to the pens and would have to take the sheep and completely submerge them in a vat of antiseptic. Like, put them under in a big vat of antiseptic. Like, baptize them in it and hold them in it and, uh, and, and hold them under. And if they didn't do that, if the shepherd didn't do that with, like, a little bit of help from other people and from his sheepdog, if he didn't do that, then if the sheep didn't go through that, they would literally be eaten by parasites and insects and die. So once a year, at least, they had to go through this process. So she wrote this, Elizabeth Elliot wrote this. One by one, John, the farmer, sees the animals. They would struggle to climb out the side and Mac, the sheepdog, would snarl and snap at their faces to force them back under. When they tried to climb up the ramp in the panicky way at the far end, John the farmer would catch them, spin them around, force them down under, hold them, ears, eyes, and nose, submerged for a few seconds. And as their Lord and Master was pushing their head under, drowning them, at least as far as they could tell, their panicky little eyes would look up over the edge of the vat, and it was easy to see what they were thinking. What is God doing <laughs> And, and I, I think of this, uh, when I read this story, it makes me think of our dog, Sullivan. Uh, when we give him a bath, it used to be a team event. Um, now, usually, our, our daughter, Aslan, does it. But this is the look he gets on his face or whatever. He looks at Aslan. And, what is God doing? And Aslan would be God in that situation. Uh, sometimes me and Shannon and Aslan would, early on, you know, give him a quick bath or whatever. And then we'd be a triune God. And, uh, but what is God doing? But, so let me give you a little bit of background on Elizabeth Elliot. I think this is interesting for when she's writing this. Um, her first husband was famously murdered by a tribe in Ecuador that they were going to take the gospel of Jesus to. She was only 29 years old at that point as, um, you know, his, as his wife, the guy that was murdered, and one of the guys that was murdered. And they'd only been married for two years. And so 13 years later, she remarried to another Christian man and her second husband died of cancer after they were married just four years. 
So at that point, she's 46 and twice widowed. She got remarried a third time later in life and, uh, and actually was married a very long time to that man, 38 years. And then she passed away at 88 before he did. But when she wrote this, think about this. She's in her 40s, and she's been twice widowed. And she says this. Elizabeth Elliot wrote this about what she saw on that farm. She said, I've had some experiences in my life which have made me feel very sympathetic to those poor sheep. There were times when I couldn't figure out any reason for the treatment I was getting from my great shepherd, whom I trusted. I, like these sheep, didn't have a hint of an explanation. And so... Here's the point. Isn't it very possible that when you're going through a storm and you feel like you're drowning, that the shepherd still isn't uncaring? Maybe he cares about you very, very deeply. Uh, There's this powerful shepherd who is more powerful, more wise, more loving even than we are. And, uh, And he could prevent this unpleasant experience, as you know, what we think. Like he could just stop this from happening. But could it be that maybe he's allowing you to be submerged in a situation in a storm, maybe because he wants you to learn something that you absolutely need to learn for the future. Something that will absolutely be vital for you to fight the good fight of faith and make it to heaven. Isn't it possible that the good shepherd would allow us to be submerged? Because we have to be. There's bigger stuff coming, or different stuff coming, or people that we can help who are coming because we've been submerged or afraid of drowning. Isn't that possible? I mean, I look back on eras of my life, and I could sit here and list them, but I look back in eras of my life when I was, you know, my terrible home life as a kid. Terrible. I would never wish it upon anyone. But terrible, like my spleen injury that almost killed me, Um, Shannon and I going through infertility struggles for years. And in the midst of that, my perspective often would have been like, what is God doing? What is God doing to me? Like, why would he not prevent? It's real easy for God to be like, okay, no, no fertility problems with you guys. No issues whatsoever. Why wouldn't he do that for me? Like, don't you care, God? It's, it's really easy in any of those situations. To do but now, after the fact, I look back, I'm like, oh, man. I totally get it. In fact, I'm thankful for my home life now. I look back, and I'm like, that bolstered my faith. It made me who I am. It gave me perspective on the kind of father I wanted to be. All that kind of stuff. And I look back and I'm like, man, I totally get it. My kids are better because of the home life I had. And like at that time, I, I didn't know that would be the case. But now I look back and like, man, that wasn't a shepherd that didn't care. I was in the vat of antiseptic, man. Like my kids' lives are so much better because I went through that storm. And so when, you know, honestly, when I think about this with all of us, with our storms that we go through, like what makes us think that we're smart enough to know the proof of God's goodness to begin with. You know what I mean? Think of this sheep perspective. Like, to even recognize when God is being good or not to us in our perspectives. Like, how could we possibly know whether he's doing the best thing for us right now? How could we possibly even know that? You can't. If there is a God, a good shepherd, then you have to trust him unconditionally, without explanation and without all your questions being answered. That's just the reality of storms. But one thing that we can't do, and it's what we're usually doing, is saying, I'll follow God as long as he's coming through for me, right? I'll follow God as long as he's coming through for me. How could you possibly know when God is coming through for you? We're sheep. Like the thing that we're going through might be essential for us to survive, to fight the good fight, to hold on to our faith, and to make it to heaven. Or bring some people to heaven with us. So you have to turn to a corner where eventually you say, man, I have no flipping idea what's going on here. But what I do know is this, I have, a, I have a good shepherd. I have a good shepherd. And whatever this is, it's not punishment. Whatever this is, it's the loving care of a shepherd that would allow me to walk through the storm. And man, when you, when you can conclude that, it brings great calm, even in the midst of a storm. It brings great calm that you can feel like you're drowning and going under, but you know he's there. And it'll be okay, even if you do drown. It'll be okay. So look at the end of the story, Mark 4, verse 39. It says, Jesus got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? 
they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. This is, this is such a cool story. So this is Jesus versus nature, okay? And a lot of times it's a mistake to take a story from Scripture and just make a symbolic point out of it. Like, we'll make this story a metaphor. Well, no, it really literally happened. You know, we'll make it a metaphor. In this case, it's both. It's a literal story of a storm, and it also is about the storm that the disciples are going through metaphorically because they're going through a storm. You know what I'm saying? So it really is about the storms of life. But Jesus stands up in the boat toward the storm, and he faces it. So it's like Jesus and this big, dark storm. He's, he's got eye crusties. And he gets up, and he's wiping his face. He gets up, and he turns toward the storm. And on the boat, somehow, miraculously, a tumbleweed blows by. You know, I'm not a strong whistler. I could never get your attention at a festival, by the way. Thank you very much. And so a tumbleweed blows by, like, how'd that get on the boat, you know? And Jesus looks at the storm and rebukes it. And he says two things, quiet, be still. And he stands in that boat, and, and the old King James Version, uh, like Shakespearean English back in the day, says, peace, be still, which is so sterile. You know, it's like, you know, he Peace, be still. These aren't the disciples you're looking to kill, you know. And, uh, but he, uh, better, better translation, one that I've heard, is that Jesus gets up and says, shut up. And like with force and attitude, shut up. And the second thing he says is, stay shut up. And so that reminds me of the old Looney Tunes when the bank robber says to Bugs Bunny, shut up, shut nap. Anybody remember that? Old people? Yeah, there we go. That's what Jesus said to the storm. Shut up, shut nap. Tumbleweed, okay. So, yeah, he, there's, but notice, he, 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 there's no conjuring here. Jesus doesn't have to, like, work himself up here. Uh, you know, he doesn't have to roll up his sleeves even. He doesn't do the Charlton Heston, you know, in the Ten Commandments where, you know, he takes a staff and holds it forth. Behold the mighty hand of God. There's no magic going on here. There's nothing like that. It's just, he says, shut up and stay shut up, and it's calm. And usually it would be like, okay, the storm might go away, but then it takes some time for the waves. Nope, when the, it's totally calm. You see in the storm, it's nothing for Jesus. It's absolutely nothing for him. He rebukes the wind and the waves, completely calm. In fact, in the Greek, the original language, um, it basically says it, it, it became mega calm. That's kind of like the, the Greek word we get mega from is in that it became mega calm. And so... This is the match between Jesus and nature. It's over in an instant. Really boring fight. Like, it's just done, okay? And so it doesn't really matter how unruly the forces are in your life. It doesn't really matter how twisted and messed up you might think they are. Your storm is no match for Jesus, okay? I'm not saying he's going to rescue you and make every storm in your life go away, but it's no match for Jesus, Nothing is a match for Jesus. Jesus is not just a match for the unruly forces in our world, nature. He's not just a match for the storms in your life that you go through or will go through. It's not even a fight. Jesus doesn't even have a sparring partner. He gets up and he's like, shut up and stay shut up. And he commands and it's done. And so in the midst of the great hurricane, Mark is showing us Jesus is the Lord of the storm. Um, you know, a few practical things from the story. First, Maybe most importantly, Jesus took naps. Be like Jesus. <laughs> naps are biblical. Amen? Amen? Thank you. Dang. And it's like, and the church came alive. <laughs> Name of Jesus. I mean, dozing, snoozing. I'm just resting my eyes, kids. All of it biblical. This is huge to me. All right. It's changed my life. I'm just saying. All right. Let's move to something a little deeper. Um, in the beginning, the disciples are scared. Notice they're scared. Like Jesus even says, why are you still, why, why, why were you afraid? So they're scared. They're like, we're going to drown. Why don't you care? And so they thought they were going to drown. Why are you so afraid? But check this out. Jesus calms the storm, and you would expect in the story that the disciples go from scared to relieved. That's not what happens, is it? The disciples go from scared to terrified. That's the progression in the story. They go from, why? What is going on here? They were terrified after he calmed the storm and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So a quick theological point, why? The reason they were terrified is because they were scared in the presence of the storm, and then they realized suddenly 
they are in the presence of someone who is not from this world. They're like, this guy's from another plane, another dimension. Who is this? Like, think about that. They've been with Jesus for months. Think about if you were one of 12 dudes camping with him every night, always spending time with Jesus, constantly in conversation. You've even seen him heal blind people and lepers and all that. Then one day, a picture of I was at Kentucky Christian University, summer in the sun, and I saw that storm coming, and someone down below me stood up and was like, shut up and stay shut up, and the thing just dropped. It just disappeared. I'd be like, what was that? Like, okay, it's one thing to heal a blind man. That's unbelievable. But this is just kind of like in a different category of miracle. Like, shut up, stay shut up. So they realize this is God. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? The, the, so the practical thing you take from that point is just this. Very often, God's solution to your problem is more terrifying than the problem. Like, think about what this means. Okay, so there's this story... Um, that Jesus tells Matthew chapter 7 about storms. It's a parable, a story with a spiritual point to it. And he says, one man builds his house and he builds it on the sand. Another man builds a house, he builds it on the rock. And the same storm eventually comes and hits the house in the sand, house in the rock. But the one in the sand collapses, it's destroyed. The one on the rock stands firm. And Jesus is like, man, trust me, obey my teachings. Make me the foundation of your life. Build your house on the rock. And so what does that mean? Well, this is what it means. If, if you love your career, but a storm comes at work, then it's, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt really bad. But if you have built your life on your career, if your foundation is your career and a storm comes at work, it'll destroy you. That's what Jesus is saying. Like, that's what storms do to people. So if you... Live for a person. A lot of people in this room probably living for a person. I'm just going to call it out because I know humans, okay? You, you love a person. Let's start there. You love a person and a storm comes in that relationship. Man, that hurts really, really bad, doesn't it? Most of us have been there. If you have built your life on this relationship, though, and a storm comes in this relationship, this person is your everything, your idol, your security, your identity. You need their approval, It'll destroy you if you've built your life on that person and their approval and their love. And so that's really what this kind of parable is teaching. So you might accuse God when you're going through a storm because of stuff going on at work. My reputation's at stake. I looked like an idiot or with a relationship. They don't, they don't love me anymore. They cheated on me. They, whatever it is, they're terrible to me. They're awful to me. And you've built your life on it. And you're like, Jesus, why don't you care? Why do you keep letting me end up with men like this? And God's like, oh, the answer is going to terrify you. You are building your house on the wrong stuff, and you've got to level it and start all over building on me. And it's not going to just be like, I'm going to fix the place up, level it. Start brand new foundation me and then we're going to build from there with everything with me as the foundation. And that's terrifying when you have a false god, an idol. And that's what those things are. Like, it's you got to let go of that false god. You've got to break up with this person. You've got to stop putting all of your hope in what people think of you at work and building your career and the accolades that you get. you got to quit finding security in this thing. you got to stop making this your identity or your priority and you have to be, begin by building your life on me, the rock. And that's terrifying. And that's ultimately what it means to trust God. Why is it terrifying? Because that's what actual faith is. I put all my weight on you, Jesus. I put all of my weight on you. That's terrifying. And that's why the disciples are more terrified of Jesus than of the storm. One more little practical point. I want you to see the point of why Mark grouped these miracles together. Um, notice the question that the miracle brings to the forefront. What question brings to the forefront? I've said it a couple times. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Okay, again, they've been with Jesus a long time, and they're asking who he is because they understand there's a big answer to that question. Mark is all about us asking the big question, not how is he such a great teacher? How is he performing these miracles? How? No, who is this? 
is the ultimate question that this story brings to light. Mark wants us to wrestle with that question. If this guy can stand up and tell the storm to shut up and stay shut up, who is this that even the wind and the waves, creation itself, nature itself obeys him and submits to him? Who is that? So for those of you who aren't there yet, keep investigating the real Jesus in the gospel of Mark and asking over and over, who is this? Not just, how can his teaching apply to my life? How can he help me? How can he take me to the next chapter of my life? How can he, how can he help me grow? No, not just that. Who is this? English New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, he once wrote this. How can you live with a terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human? The fire has become flesh, and life itself became life and walked in our midst. Christianity either means that or it means nothing. The question is, who is this? The real Jesus was God with us, come to die for our sins so that we would put faith in him and say, I've paid a substitutionary payment for your sins so you could be saved and have a relationship with God. And for that reason, the hurricane became human. Let's pray.